Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Jackie Fernandez Hamburg. I'm the curator of the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And we're thrilled to have you here for this first event in the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum's Winter Share Your Culture, Share Your Research series. Our next event will take place December 1st with UPIC artist and carver Jennifer and Guy Wood. Uh, she'll be giving a presentation at noon. So join us again if you're able to. That talk will just be on Zoom. But here today, we're fortunate enough to have our guest speaker present at the Sheldon Jackson Museum and also with you on Zoom. Uh, I'd like to introduce her. First, I'll do the land acknowledgement. This is the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum's land acknowledgement. So welcome, we would like to acknowledge and express our appreciation to the indigenous people of Tlingit Ani who have occupied this land for longer than any of us can imagine and who after 250 years of colonization in Alaska are graciously sharing this land with us. Thank you. Sabina Allen is Ghanak Dady Raven and child of the Kogwantan clan. She received her undergraduate degree in Native American Studies at Dartmouth College and is now a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on climate change and Tlingit oral history. Specifically, she considers the long history uh, and catastrophe um, in Southeast Alaska, excuse me, and the way traditional knowledge has um, influenced current responses to climate change. She's currently conducting her dissertation fieldwork in Sitka, and we're pleased to have her to give this presentation entitled Complicating Discourse about Tlingit Ecological Traditional Knowledge and Climate, Catast climate um, Policy, Change Policy in Southeast Alaska. Thank you so much for being here, Sabina, and I welcome her to introduce herself now. Yeah. All right. Um Gunal's Chish Hat Yi Adi, Andach June, you had to a sock, like a hinach Sabina, you had to a sock, Ganach Tedi, Nahat City, Kagwantan Yadi. Uh, so, as Jackie mentioned, uh, my name is Andach Jun, my English name is Sabina Allen, I'm Ganach TD and a child of the Kogwantan clan, um, and I'm also a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Chicago. My research considers climate change, um, specifically through the lens of oral history and traditional knowledge. I'm interested in the ways that indigenous knowledge and values are being mobilized by tribal governments, inks of corporations, and nonprofits focused on Southeast Alaska Native issues. And as Jackie also mentioned, I'm currently conducting my field work here in Sitka, um, which will be ongoing until next summer. So the talk that I'm going to give today is based on my preliminary research findings and interviews. Um, as I learn more about local concerns and issues, I've been working through my theoretical approach to these topics. I'll be focusing on a very small sliver of this process today, and I will specifically be considering the way we talk about indigenous knowledge systems, um, and in particular about what much of academic literature calls traditional ecological knowledge, as well as how I have observed this being implemented during my fieldwork. Some aspects of this talk might eventually form the basis for a part of my dissertation, but for now, these are all in very early development. In recent years, TEK has become somewhat of a buzzword, especially in policy and collaboration with indigenous communities. Collaborative projects have gained traction, including co-management and co-stewardship projects. However, based on interviews, it seems to me that despite the desire for collaboration and co-creation of knowledge, there continues to be a lack of understanding and sometimes a lack of respect regarding indigenous knowledge. A lot has been written on this issue of incommensurability that often arises when non-Indigenous people look to Indigenous knowledge. These were ideas that I had previously explored during my coursework, but I wanted to revisit them in relation to my preliminary research findings. Let's see. So throughout the talk, I will need to define a few terms that I will continue to tease out um, and I will continue to tease out their meanings as I work through an, examples and variations. The first is epistemology, which refers to a knowledge system. I will be referring to both indigenous and Western epistemologies throughout the talk. 
Next, there is traditional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. These are essentially one idea which encompasses all forms of Indigenous knowledge as accumulated through many generations of living on traditional homelands and is also represented in oral history. TEK is more specifically referring to knowledge that relates to the environment, although arguably such knowledge is in fact inseparable from larger Indigenous epistemologies. While there are debates over the use of the term TEK, much existing scholarship uses this term and seeks to define it. As such, for the purposes of, of this talk, I will be using traditional ecological knowledge for ease of jumping between different scholars and debates. I have not yet decided on terminology for my dissertation, and as with everything I present today, determining that language um, will be an ongoing part of my fieldwork. So I would first like to discuss some of the essential aspects of TEK, I will then discuss some misunderstandings that can arise, especially due to stereotypes about Indigenous people, and then conclude with some examples of projects I've seen so far in my fieldwork that might address some of these issues. When discussing TEK, Anishinaabe scholar Nicholas Rio illustrates the relationship between values or morals, experience, and practices as seen in this chart. So here we can see knowledge with species, populations, habitats, and geography, practice, skills, technique, expertise, rules, and rituals, and then beliefs, spirituality, values, and moral judgments. And we can see how these are all uh, mutually constituting one another in this process. Um, so through this understanding, we can see how over generations, knowledge has been accumulated through practice. It informs and is informed by morals and values, which all come together in ind Indigenous epistemologies. Despite attempts by the Western knowledge system to separate out these various parts, it is key to understand TEK holistically. This includes ethical and spiritual dimensions that are built into TEK and are inalienable from its essence. Rio writes, quote, a common tendency is to seek data-oriented information from TEK holders, ignoring ethical or spiritual dimensions such as traditional values and the nature of human-animal relations, end quote. It is vital not to eliminate these elements in discussions of TEK and to include them in holistic considerations. It is also important to note that TEK is local knowledge. Another issue with attempting to utilize TEK in a Western system is extracting it out of its social, cultural, and environmental context to allow for broader applicability. Local tribes and other organizations resist this in their programs, seeking to emphasize the importance of a local approach that considers knowledge relevant to that place. TEK differs from Western science because it looks holistically at relationality in ecosystems rather than attempting to silo individual species or parts. This is a strength that policymakers have come, become more interested in in recent years, especially regarding current challenges from climate change and so-called resource management. As Githala scholar Charles Menzies writes, quote, the way that indigenous people live off the land often means that they need to understand the way that different plants and animals interrelate, how the ecosystem works as a whole, and how they can use that system to sustain themselves. This type of small scale yet system wide understanding is the approach that resource managers are turning to in order to better manage natural resources and the environment as a whole, end quote. This approach provides Indigenous communities with a rich understanding of their impact on the environment. This also provides unique insights about the vast expanse of knowledge from generations and generations of experience. Menzies also writes, quote, traditional ecological knowledge can complement, supplement, and guide biological science and resource management. TEK can provide both the appropriate questions to ask about natural resources and ecosystems and the missing answers to some existing questions, end quote. This wealth of knowledge is thus extremely valuable, even beyond the scope of Indigenous communities. Even while we acknowledge this, Menzies argues that we must also be aware of the social systems within which TEK is created and maintained. For example, a huge issue now that elders often mention is that traditional knowledge is sometimes no longer reliable because of climate change. For example, while Shinget knowledge provides rules for when shellfish harvest is safe, these rules are no longer a reliable metric about when to harvest and do not necessarily mean that the shellfish are not toxic. This necessitated the creation of the Southeast Alaska Tribal Oceans Research, or CEDAR, through Sika Tribe of Alaska. Because of environmental variability, it is necessary to test for toxicity and warn communities about potential problems. 
However, because this program grew out from STA, traditional ecological knowledge was still a basis for the formation of and the need for the program. The very fact of tracing the way that this knowledge is no longer reliable is a valuable tool in climate change um, assessment and mitigation. As such, TEK can now adapt to these new conditions and be supplemented in the case of shellfish by Western science. TEK is constantly adapting and changing to account for new factors. It is not a thing of the past, but is constantly being made and remade. Indigenous epistemologies are formed through traditional knowledge practices based on experience on the land. In the past and today, this knowledge has been the basis for Indigenous peoples living well and in good relationality with the lands and waters of our home, of our homelands. Due to genocide, colonization, and assimilation, many indigenous traditions have been suppressed, leading to gaps in these knowledge systems. Now, native people must contend with settler colonial influence when thinking about all aspects of life. Settler governance has prevented passing on knowledge to younger generations. It has fundamentally changed the prevalence and ease of harvesting traditional foods and has interrupted the ability to steward our lands and waters. There are a number of projects aimed at addressing these issues, thereby providing opportunities to enact and expand sovereign rights of tribal governments. Such projects also provide valuable insights into topics that Western science might otherwise ignore. Ideally, this is then used for the benefit of tribes and other native organizations in climate mitigation strategies and resource management. Despite its importance historically and today, TEK is often misunderstood and misinterpreted when translated into the Western epistemology. The two different knowledge systems do not have the same basic assumptions, which often causes mistranslations and which tend to favor and prioritize the dominant settler system of knowledge. These misunderstandings have numerous causes, but one commonality between many of them is the lack of understanding by settler society about Indigenous peoples, broadly speaking. Because of colonization, there exist a number of stereotypes about Indigenous peoples in settler society. These permeate the entertainment industry and popular culture, as well as academic institutions, and general cultural consciousness. Oftentimes, Native epistemologies are associated with mystical beliefs that are either dismissed for being subjective religion unworthy of further, further exploration, or that are fetishized and fundamentally misunderstood even when they are taken seriously. When discussing environmental issues, a major influence in these stereotypes is the figure of the ecological Indian or the ecologically noble savage. At a basic level, these terms gesture to the stereotype that native people are inherently environmentalists and close to nature. The term is complex because the social capital behind these stereotypes can be used to assist in resource protection and sovereignty, but the term can also evoke harmful stereotypes. We can see what one such example in this crying Indian anti-pollution ad by Keep America Beautiful. This image in the ad it comes from may be familiar to some of those in attendance. Um, this still is taken from a longer ad that first aired on Earth Day in 1971. The ad campaign played into settler guilt about treatment of native peoples and also relied on stereotypes about the ecologically noble savage. It also featured an actor who was actually of Italian descent, although he claimed native ancestry. So this is a classic example um, of such imagery and popular culture. Before exploring the implications of the ecological Indian further, I wanna explore some of the academic debates around this term. The term was first coined in the book titled The Ecological Indian by anthropologist Shepard Crutch III. The book argues that native people intentionally position themselves as ecological Indians as a means of recuperating sovereignty and identity, thereby projecting this identity into the past. Crutch argues that native people have no inherent claim to environmental awareness, citing resource extraction on reservations and capitulation to economic stressors. Penobscot scholar Darren Ranko solidly deconstructs this argument, pointing out that essentially the historical context of colonization is missing. This not only influences the way that native lands have been used and extracted, but also leads native people to sometimes actually mobilize the stereotype of the ecological Indian to better protect those lands and waters. Ranko argues that the ecological Indian is sometimes an important tool in land and water protection, allowing communities to emphasize dimensions of their relationship to homelands that would otherwise be ignored by Western science. From here, we need to understand that the settler concept of nature has been fundamentally shaped by colonization due to what some scholars call ecocide. 
Indeed, Ranko details the lineage of this term, explaining that it refers to the destruction of ecosystems through resource extraction and other federal policies that make maintaining land-based practices extremely difficult. This relates to an argument made by Charles Mann in his book, 1491, which argues that by the time large areas of the hemisphere were being colonized, a large portion of the native population had already been decimated by disease. The settler imaginary of vacant lands and even the very nature of the ecosystems themselves was fundamentally shaped by the fact that native people were no longer stewarding the lands at the same scale as they had been prior to colonization. All that is to say that the very understanding of what indigenous stewardship has or could look like is deeply incomplete in the Western consciousness. This further invalidates Crutch's argument about the ecological Indian. Because of settler colonialism, the very concept of nature is constructed in a way that erases native people from landscapes. Conservationism and environmentalism arose from this cultural context and construction of nature. As such, these ideas emerge from the Western epistemology and lack the context to understand indigenous relationships with homelands. It also ignores the fact that Western systems force indigenous people into challenging and unfair situations. Menzies, for example, points out that oftentimes conservation for cultural activities involves what he calls cultural triage. In many circumstances, native communities and tribes are forced to place value judgments on lands and traditions and to select the most important places or traditions, thereby accepting that other places are in turn used for development or extraction. This may appear to be selling out to crutch, but this ignores the impossible conditions that force native people to prioritize arbitrarily while existing within a system that they did not choose. In addition to its lack of nuance within academic discussions, the ecological Indian can primitivize and otherize native people. It can also set up unreasonable and unattainable standards for native communities that are unfair and ultimately detrimental. The discourse about native people and environmentalist movements is thus fraught and contradictory. This contradictory Contradictory discourse has influenced the way that conservationists and environmentalists view indigenous peoples. Sometimes native people are viewed as allies in environmental struggles and are lauded as inherent environmentalists. However, native people and environmentalists often also have clashes, for example, over fishing rights or the practice of whaling. In such cases, native people are villainized. Additionally, some conservationists subscribe to the idea that any human influence on the environment is detrimental. Native peoples are thus thought to live in perfect harmony with nature, or in other words, to have no impact on their environments. This is not the case. Native people have always profoundly shaped environments, but not necessarily in a detrimental way. For example, the traditional practice of prescribed burning drastically changes the ecosystem, but also helps to prevent larger and more devastating forest fires. However, such nuance is sometimes lost in these debates, and Native people are criticized when they do not fit within this impossible and historically inaccurate metric. There's also debate over how Indigenous knowledge interacts with Western scientific knowledge about the environment. Menzies writes, quote, in resource management scenarios, TEK is often placed in opposition to Western science, particularly biology. Comparing TEK and science in such a way tends to oversimplify and emphasize the differences between these two ways of seeing the world. This can make them appear incompatible and is therefore somewhat unproductive. Such comparisons can also mask over important points of similarity and commonality, such as the fact that the underlying principles of TEK and science rely upon similar principles of observation, end quote. Not only do they appear incompatible, but TEK is often denigrated and thought to be inferior to Western science. It is made out to be unsubstantiated and frivolous as opposed to supposedly objective Western science. As Vanessa Watts writes, quote, our understandings of the world are often viewed as mythic by modern society, while our stories are considered to be an alternative mode of understanding and interpretation rather than real events, end quote. This creates two related but distinct, distinct reactions from settler society. Those who admire the mystical and magical pseudo-spiritualist stereotype of indigeneity might take this up as the only authentic form of TEK. It must include certain markers like burning sage or bringing out regalia drums and songs. Despite the fact that these are authentic and vital aspects of indigenous cultures, TEK need not always take this form, and stereotypes about such practices are unhelpful. 
This is also not aided by the fact that, as Rio contends, quote, the traditional belief system of tribal communities are arguably the least studied and most misunderstood aspect of TEK, end quote. However, when actually considering morality and values, it is clear that these are essential in understanding TEK. The aesthetic of indigenous spiritual practices is highly sought out by non-native people. And so this is what the image on the slide is gesturing to. Um, so this is a quote from the movie Smoke Signals. And it says, during the 60s, Arnold Joseph was the perfect hippie because all the hippies were trying to be Indians anyway. So the point being that they were appropriating these or attempting to appropriate these spiritual beliefs, but in a very surface level and aesthetic way with the way they were dressing and, and things like that. Um, however, because much of TEK research ignores this element, so of spirituality, it is also not very well understood outside of communities. As a result, it's rarely considered seriously alongside Western science. As such, those more inclined towards a scientific outlook might make the same assumption of mystical spiritualism and immediately dismiss TEK as an inferior knowledge system. No matter the reaction, TEK and Native peoples should not have to bend to the settler imaginary um, to be considered valid or worthwhile. This is also a delicate balance between many tensions. There is an appeal to Western science, but not because it's a superior form of knowledge. TEK is similar to Western science, but it is unique. Indigenous spiritual practices are at the core of TEK, but this aspect should not be appropriated or viewed only aesthetically. TEK can help to inform Western science, but it should not be extracted and used as, quote, a tool of Western science, end quote, as Menzies writes. All these tensions and dangers are connected to indigenous knowledge not being taken on its own terms or within its own context. On the whole, this might appear to be a bleak outlook on the potential for TEK. But local and regional organizations are already encountering and working around these issues, as I have seen repeatedly in my fieldwork. These projects do generally entail understanding TEK within an Indigenous framework. Indeed, one path to facilitate this is through the process of indigenizing. To indigenize is to incorporate Indigenous knowledge systems into practices that may originally be a part of a non-Indigenous system. For example, indigenizing Western education institutions might look like bringing elders into the, into the classroom to work with youth. Such a form of pedagogy is traditional, for example, in a Thinget context, but largely absent in the Western system. In my fieldwork, the most direct example of indigenizing I have seen is through the work of Spruce Root, which for anyone not familiar, provides business mentoring, small business lending and education and access to funding sources and collaborative partnerships in Southeast Alaska. I spoke with several staff members about how the organization struggles with communicating what it means to indigenize, especially when that includes indigenizing practices that appear to be fundamentally Western. When utilizing indigenous knowledge does not match up with stereotypes, it may be dismissed as being not native enough. This may simply be because efforts to indigenize are not aesthetic or flashy. These external stereotypes about what it means to be indigenous make some aspects of indigeneity more legible from a Western perspective. Projects that engage only with deeper ethical and spiritual dimensions of knowledge often lack these legible external markers. Because these dimensions are also less researched and less talked about, that makes them all the more difficult for non-indigenous people to understand. When thinking about how native values might guide the direction of Western systems, the underlying basis for that work is a Southeast Alaska native worldview, which is inherently rooted in morality, ethics, and spirituality. Because it requires deeper engagement, this type of indigenizing is easier to overlook. If non-native people want to start engaging seriously with indigenous knowledge, they need to more deeply consider what this looks like in practice, while still respecting the boundaries of what is appropriate for them to know. Additionally, the emphasis needs to be on projects that directly benefit Native communities. With this in mind, I want to further consider Spruce Root and their efforts to indigenize lending and their business plan templates. These two concepts, lending and business plans, emerge from a Western way of thinking. However, that does not mean that they are mutually exclusive with Indigenous ways of knowing and being. Traditional knowledge shows us a particular way of being in and relating to the world. As such, indigenizing these ideas involves rethinking their basic principles through a Southeast Alaska Native lens and incorporating those values and ideas into the system constructed by settler colonialism so that it works better for Native people. This does work to intellectually reshape what these concepts mean and also makes it more accessible from a framework of TEK.
In this way, the Western system itself is actually being appropriated by Native people in order to benefit the community. Making Western, Western systems work for TEK involves different stages of engagement that can go in many different ways. The examples I'm going to use are data collection, presentation of information, and action being taken using this knowledge. So when we think about data collection, methodologies are important to consider. Even when outside researchers do seek out TEK, some Native people may be reluctant to share, given past negative experiences with scientific research and sharing sacred sites or the location of traditional foods. As such, it may be safer and more comfortable for tribes to conduct internal data collection. Clinkett and Haida is trying to do just this with current projects through the Native Lands and Resources Division, and specifically its Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network. This project aims to collect more data that might emerge from TEK. The network will specifically target the local aspect of TEK with tribes in each community maintaining control of the data, how they wanna gather it, what they wanna gather and how they want it to be used. This project will thus have the potential to use a variety of data collection and storage methods drawing from both indigenous and Western epistemologies. When tribes have control over data, this prevents extraction and is advantageous because it allows the knowledge to be used alongside Western science or to guide it by identifying the right questions to ask. Such a model works best when tribes are working to collect data for their own usage or when collaborating with trustworthy partners. After data has been collected, there is the question of how to convey that information. Of course, this requires decision about audience and intended purpose. Um, however, TEK is um, often presented alongside Western science. Well, one option would be to present it as data. Another example is to require your audience to consider TEK within a more indigenous framework. For example, in Clinton and Haida's climate adaptation plan, author Kenneth Weitzel told me that he worked to slip traditional knowledge into the report whenever possible. The plan lays out a regional outlook on climate issues in Southeast Alaska, relying heavily on Western climate change research. However, it also invokes traditional knowledge, specifically in the form of Clinket proverbs that Weitzel worked into the report. The proverbs work to quickly convey indigenous knowledge in a form that does not attempt to convert it to data. The reader must switch into a different mode of thinking to interpret a graph about temperature fluctuations versus a proverb. In this case, TEK is presented alongside Western science and demands a different engagement with this knowledge by interrupting traditional modes of science communication. This is especially effective in communicating priorities based on community needs. As such, the use of TEK can serve to actually guide research rather than outside researchers deciding what is valuable to the community. This avoids TEK being used as only a tool to advance Western science. There are a variety of ways that TEK can be utilized with just one example being as a guide for scientific research. This is something that tribes, for example, are thinking about. STA's Climate Vulnerability Assessment and Adaptation Plan identifies local priorities and some of the gaps in knowledge that exist. Author Elizabeth Bornman explained to me that the priorities identified through TEK and by community can then be explored through Western science as needed. Because knowledge bearers know the landscape better, they can make observations that Western science would not think to make. In turn, this can shape research that is already ongoing. Menzies writes, quote, indigenous experiences as expressed through TEK have the potential to give us a picture of the rapid transformations of the landscape and natural resources since colonial settlement and also a potential baseline indicator that predates much scientific study, end quote. For example, oral history, traditional harvesting areas, and the memories of elders can tell us a lot about historical abundance in populations that might not have been on the radar of Western science. I've just laid out a few examples for how traditional knowledge can adapt the Western system to work best for Southeast Alaska Natives. This appeal to Western systems and science is sometimes a necessary strategic move, just as the ecological Indian is sometimes a necessary tool. In some cases, it is useful to emphasize the similarities between Western science and indigenous knowledge. In other cases, emphasizing the difference, for example, the holistic approach of indigenous epistemologies and the fact that there are moral and spiritual dimensions is more advantageous. One way or another, it needs to be communicated that in this case, Shinget people know the most about our own homelands and Shinget people should be the one shaping any research that is being done. <laughs> 
working alongside Western science and using that form of research to answer important questions is another form of TEK adapting as needed. Here, it adjusts not only in content, but also in form. Instead of only being passed down orally, it can now be stored in a database. Instead of only using Git methods of observation, now Western scientific methods are also used. Indeed, the very fact of change and adaptation is central in Tlingit thought, and it is reflected in our values as Native people. TEK is a living form of knowledge that changes to use the available and necessary tools. As more and more discussions arise about co-management and co-stewardship projects, it is important to be aware of stereotypes that may emerge. It is important to see how historical discourse emerging from settler colonialism is shaping current perceptions of TEK and projects about it, as we work to adapt and record TEK, we also have to consider how to adapt our communication about it, and in turn, the type of Western scientific work that can complement it. I hope to continue exploring these issues in my fieldwork and eventually in my dissertation and other academic writing. Going forward, I wanna think more about how adaptation itself is an indigenous mode of being and how that emerges in oral tradition, as well as in projects that are happening today. I also hope to continue tracing the historical elements that have influenced the way Indigenous knowledge is discussed. And of course, I will continue to explore a variety of projects that are working to communicate and implement traditional knowledge. This has been a rough sketch attempting to synthesize a number of interrelated ideas, including TEK, the ecological Indian, and indigenizing Western systems. As discussions continue and projects further develop in Southeast Alaska utilizing TEK and indigenous knowledge more broadly, it will be necessary to continue to hone and improve communication. This is yet another form of Thinget adaptation. If we look to our ancestors and to Hakusti, our way of life, we can see that adaptation past, present, and future. As the world continues to change and adapt, so too will TEK and the ways we discuss it. Thank you and Gunas Chish for listening. Wow. Sabina, any questions from the audience? So in the biography of Dr. Richard Nelson, one of the problems he had in the 1960s in getting his thesis approved was that he was writing from the viewpoint as much as he could as a Westerner mm -hmm. of Native Alaskans, Native Americans. And that was viewed at the time as uh, heretical, <clears throat> like heresy, yeah. you know, traditional anthropology. And it took a long time for that to be accepted. And it sounds to me like you're saying very much that it's still not accepted throughout your field, which yes. I find a bit shocking. Because 60 years ago that he wrote his thesis. Yes, I would say we are definitely still in the midst of figuring that out. Um, there are, there's a lot of like conflict in the discipline um, about that topic. So there's something that um, anthropologists or academics call uh, the ontological turn. And this is kind of what you're referring to where it's like, you're, you're trying to look at it um, you know, from an indigenous perspective and you're trying to not just bring like outside, you know, theories in and just like apply them kind of top down to the community. Um, but there are a lot of people who think that the ontological turn is just as bad and that it is doing this kind of fetishizing that I'm talking about. Um, so that's a big debate. And then there's also a lot of debate over, you know, is it okay to be someone working within your own community? And I've gotten a lot of pushback, um, you know, as I've been in this program from people who say, you know, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Like you're too close to the issues. You won't be able to look at it objectively, you know, things like that. Um, and so there's definitely, that's still kind of an ongoing debate. And I think the, you know, the position of like the native anthropologist is kind of another step in figuring out what that's gonna look like in, in the discipline trying to kind of define itself like within these, you know, new terms moving forward. Not good. Uh, good to teach your talk. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is like, I guess, sort of a um, bigger picture theoretical question about your use of the um, term TEK mm -hmm. versus something like indigenous science. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've noticed 
reading, usually from scientists, is that there are people who um, want to say, indigenous people have been doing science for a long time. It looks yeah. different from Western science, but it's science nonetheless. So we have Western science that has a whole bunch of processes and procedures and a bunch of knowledge that we gain from it. But then we also have indigenous science that looks different, has different sorts of methods, but is science. And that it's all under this umbrella. Um, but it seems like you are making like a theoretical choice to um, conceptualize indigenous knowledge about the natural world as DEK rather than something like indigenous science. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to why you prefer that way of conceptualizing what you're talking about over what I'm describing or what yeah. like, I've noticed on specifically scientists wanting to talk about um, for indigenous knowledge about the natural world. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't necessarily like I wouldn't make the claim that I necessarily prefer the term TEK. Um, when I was thinking about this talk, I was like intellectually drawing on a lot of literature that happens to use the term TEK. Um, so I kind of went into it, you know, with that lens. And as far as so that's kind of just like a very basic, like for this talk, that's why I was focusing on TEK. But as far as like a sort of larger theoretical discussion, um, I think honestly that both terms can be useful. I think that it probably is context dependent, you know, like what are you trying to emphasize? So like if you are going in and you're needing to, you know, just have the basic level of like, we need to under be able to understand this, um, you know, at the same level as like Western science, or, you know, we need to um, be able to like, utilize this like as data, like alongside, you know, data that was collected, um, you know, via Western science, for example, then I think, you know, that might be a case where indigenous science would be a really helpful term to be like, no, we are asserting that this is science, you know, and, and we really need to emphasize this aspect. However, I also think that sometimes um, that way of thinking can kind of get you trapped in this idea that like, all science, you know, can kind of mesh easily together. Um, and I feel like that can sometimes erase some of what I've been talking about, which, you know, the spiritual, um, the kind of moral and ethical dimensions that exist in a very particular way within indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and that, you know, sometimes you need to be emphasizing that aspect more. And then also potentially um, the idea of rather than indigenous science, like traditional ecological knowledge and with under the umbrella of traditional knowledge is being able to not silo these things out. So if we're saying, okay, it's indigenous science, um, you know, within the Western imaginary that has a very particular disciplinary, um, you know, implication. Um, and I think that sometimes that might be less harm or that might be more harmful if we're trying to take this sort of, um, you know, more holistic like systems approach to our thinking. So I think it really depends on context, but I hope that like provides a little bit more information about like the way I was thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, well, so I think that was an awesome topic. I really love the and this it was so fantastic watching you trace the nuances both of the like complexity of understanding traditional systems of knowledge, thinking about them, how uh, all of us native and non-native try to try to wrap our heads around them, understand how we might relate to them and how they might relate to the world and help us explain the world and, and so forth, and then also that second layer of how those things are communicated and, and what strategies are used to um, help those traditional systems do the work they need to do in the world. And, you know, I was particularly struck just by your ability to talk through like these different simplifications that have sometimes real political value, you know, the ecological Indian or on the flip side, just kind of like, well, Native people just did science and it was just empirical science, you know, and, and and how you know uh, these are totally simplifications, and yet they can really achieve concrete things when they're used in the world, like you know, get grant money, get you know, whatever it is. And I guess I just was thinking as you were talking, I was wondering, you know, is there 
is there a uh, some kind of really careful line that has to be drawn between the actual stuff and the communicating so that the communicating the the language used to communicate it doesn't end up corrupting or yeah. or but then on the other hand we're talking about adaptability of the central value of all of this so maybe some of that communication inevitably is going to shake I just wanted to think I just ask your your thoughts on what is the relationship between the rhetorical strategies to communicate, for lack of a better term, traditionally yeah. logical knowledge, and the continued development of traditional ecological knowledge within native communities? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is really tricky. Like, I think it is really kind of this fine line that you're um, alluding to because it's hard when we're when we're thinking about like okay this this knowledge system it's not you know static it's not like I feel like some people would think of it as being like pure in a very particular way and I think that that's just not the case um and so I feel like potentially like as these things develop more that might need to be you know something that um that is actually discussed more and that's not really something I've you know, maybe people are having those discussions. It's not something that I've really heard before. Um, but I think that that would kind of bear, you know, more thinking about going forward. But as far as like, I think that there are some things that um, that the line is not quite as fine. So like, for example, in um, the Darren Renko piece that I had mentioned, um, he talks about, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I think he gives this example of an elder who's talking about this very like deep relationship that he has with like a river or a stream. Um, and this is a case where Ranko says, okay, this is, you know, a time when we maybe utilize the ecological Indian stereotype a little bit to try to like communicate that. Um, but I think that in this case, it's like, you're never really going to be able to fully communicate that experience, you know, the experience of that elder who is like having this relationship, you know, with something on his homelands in this very deep, um, you know, in place-based way. And so maybe you can, you know, get part of the way there. Like if you brought people there and you had him, you know, tell a story about it, um, you know, and that would obviously be a much different form of communication than if you're just writing about it in like a grant application, like you were saying. But in that case, I feel like there is really something, um, like very like deep that's going on with that rootedness in place that I don't think would necessarily be corrupted by this ecological Indian stereotype because I feel like it's almost just something that it's like we're just you know we're brushing the surface to try to get you to understand this a little bit so that you can you know provide us with um like you know or help us get to the goal that we want to establish so that would be kind of my my initial thoughts on it yeah I'm just thinking about the last three questions um, and this distinction between traditional ecological knowledge and Western science and what we might lose when we conflate them. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You have written elsewhere about objects and subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you were saying about the concern in academia about Native people being too close to be objective yeah. is really fundamental because the Native knowledge systems that you're interested in and talking about, objectivity is really not a value because those cultures are all about subjectivity and understanding knowledge mm -hmm. point of view yeah. and place. So I think exploring that tension between objectivity and subjectivity in discussing um, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science can be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, especially because I think what's interesting is that you know, a lot of like, you know, what you might call like TEK is so deeply ingrained, like, for example, in like Tlingit culture with like Atu, you know, so there's like a lot of knowledge that is like held in these in the Atu and in these stories. And, um, you know, those that's the type of thing that you're referring to, I was speaking about like museums and um, like ceremonial belongings. Um, and so, you know, those are really like, if you're thinking of it first of like, you know, subject object, like those are very much subjects, you know, where it's like this, there's so much more that's like deeper that's going on. It's not just the thing that's sitting there. Um, and like, how can we, 
understand, um, you know, TEK like in those terms. And then also thinking about like, if we are thinking about of it as like data, like what, um, what are the, the ways that even in that case, we can kind of bring this like subject positionality, like to that information, because it shouldn't be treated as just, oh, these are just numbers on a page. You know, that's, that really disagrees, I think, fundamentally with like indigenous epistemologies, sort of broadly speaking. Yeah. So one of the topics which comes close to this, very close, is loss of information over time. Things get reinvented that were actually known two, three thousand years ago, but lost. Yeah. And one of the importance of this is the fact that if you try and change it in form, you actually lose some of the information. That yeah. the uh, concept that people have made discoveries over 10, 12,000 years in this land that were essential to their survival is also useful knowledge that is a shame to lose because we want to take a different epistemological system to express knowledge and science. That's one of the yeah. problems of yes. using only one system to approach a problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even like thinking about this move from like the oral, like only in the oral to, you know, when you have things written down, it's like, okay, how does the conveyance of that knowledge, you know, what did that, what has that looked like? And, um, you know, what are the potentials for like how we could continue to kind of maybe pass these things down in different ways so that, you know, it's recorded in, in multiple different ways and that that could like strengthen the information um, going forward. Well, these wonderful questions from the audience and Sitka. Just in the interest of time, I'd like to give people on Zoom an opportunity to enter their questions in a chat. Maybe we could take two questions from Zoom. And then before people on Zoom uh, sign off, I am going to type within the chat after the next two questions a link to a survey. We're currently undergoing an interpretive planning process, and we'd love to get your input. Uh, it'll provide you know broad themes for our exhibits interpretation, inform our marketing approach, et cetera. So I will type that in after we take the next few questions and um, please help us by filling that out. Thank you. I'm waiting to see if anything comes in. Any questions? Not yet. No? No. If anyone has a question you'd like to submit in the chat, feel free. No, was that it? No questions from the chat. Okay, right. anybody in the audience? Rebecca? Yes. <laughs> You're the last question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking about uh, what you think about um, you know, as far as like trying to uh, you know raise awareness of what the traditional ecological knowledge means is would be to go at it from the other side and raise awareness that that. Western science is also cultural. It's also yeah. very loaded and subjective, you know, just in what yeah. information it's to and the, the whole myth that it's just data. Yeah. Um, you know, but just that Western science is just as cultural. Yes. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. And that's kind of why I was trying to refer to like the Western epistemology throughout, because it is, it's, you know, we have to understand that all these things are construct, you know, um, they're constructed culturally. And also, um, I think at one point I was referring it to like as objective in quotes, because I think that is something, it's funny because sometimes in anthropology, for example, people will be like, oh, you're not objective enough. But at the same time, anthropology is all about questioning, you know, the very idea that that, that is something that could exist. Um, and so I think that that is also something that I'm going to be looking at going forward is, um, you know, wanting to, like you said, kind of deconstruct um, that side of it. And to, I think that's something that often is overlooked just kind of in the public, public consciousness because of the way that science has been, you know, constructed that it's like, well, of course it's got to be right because it's science. Um, and so thinking like, okay, no, we need to really start breaking that down on like a larger, like cultural scale kind of from a Western perspective. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, or I just think it might help to, you know, to see, yeah, it just is different systems yeah. and not one overarching the other. Yeah. Like yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah.
Well, thanks so much, Sabina. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, please fill out your survey if you can help us. We've got writing utensils here and I'll type that in the chat. Um, see, and Chris, I'm just seeing your question now. We'll get Sabina to answer that offline. Thank you. I also have one here too. So I'm not going to go one out. I just had a chance there.